Well, promoting the TV movie Stay the Night with Barbara Hershey that was going to be on ABC. Jane uh, Alexander was on Later with Bob Costas, April Fool's Day, 1992. And you watch these 30-year-old interviews and how open and frank and brave by today's standards people are for talking about what they believe or feel or think is the way the world works or situations are. And I'm almost certain this interview would attract unwarranted attention in the social media fake way that sadly we live. Watching these interviews, my gosh, have we dumbed ourselves down. Staying up later, the actress Jane Alexander is with us. She's been Oscar nominated for, uh, let me see if I can remember, The Great White Hope. All the President's Men, Testament, and Kramer versus Kramer, slews of Emmy nominations and Tony nominations as well. And let's just start arbitrarily with The Great White Hope, because that was both your Broadway stage debut and, as it turned out, your film debut. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that, it doesn't happen that way that often anymore, where the same two people who originate a role on stage go to the screen with it, as you did with James Earl Jones. Right. Well, I didn't really think that I was going to <laughs> be going to the screen um, because there were a lot of famous actresses coming to see the Broadway show. And I, 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 I didn't really think that I had a chance, except I, uh, I, I looked pretty swell the night I won the Tony. And the next day, they, um, they offered me the part in a movie. So the acceptance that night on national TV made the difference, you think? I think so, yeah. Yeah. Uh, as most people know, it's the story of the life of uh, the legendary heavyweight champion in the early part of, of this century, Jack Johnson, uh, played so tremendously by James Earl Jones. The movie was generally well received, but the general tone of the reviews were just fine, but can't touch the stage production. Do mm. you agree with that? Well. Uh, I mean, I thought the movie was pretty terrific, but in fact it was almost a carbon copy of the stage performance, and in that sense it was a little too theatrical. Howard Sackler, who wrote the play, also wrote the screenplay, and perhaps that was a mistake, I don't know. It wasn't opened up sufficiently. And I think that Ed Sheeran, who directed it, and who is my husband now, um, I think he did such an impressive job with the stage production. It was hard to divorce yourself from the images. And although mm -hmm. Marty Ritt did a fine job with the screenplay. As I say, it wasn't virtually different than the play. I haven't seen everything that you've done, but I've seen a good portion of it, and I think it's fair to say uh, that your work is generally praised for its controlled emotion, and yet there are scenes in The Great White Hope where you really let it loose, especially the, the breakup scene where you're right in one another's faces. Oh, gosh, yeah. That was, uh, that was exhausting to do every night. It was really really exhausting and not the least of which was James Earl had to whip me with a towel and in order to get uh, a nice snap on the towel it had to be a little damp and uh -huh. he tried hard not to hit me but it was virtually impossible not to most for the most part and so I was lacerated regularly <laughs> because it cuts you know the, a wet towel will cut right through your I won't go, Jack. You know you're coming, now start moving. This way, we'll go. Don't cross me now. I thought we'd save some. I said move! Please, move. I only meant that we'd Don't do it now. No more lousy grub, you gotta puke up. No more you're looking like a washed out rag here, your eye twitching all the time. No, don't, I don't care. Just I'll move! I'll take better care of myself. Hanging on me, dead weight. No, for you, Jack. I'll start. I'll find a job, that's what I'm I told doing. you when my mama died, I said to leave me be. I can't run anymore, no, not you, by myself. You got your own people. No, you're a young woman. I'll never make You're gonna find no one else. Tough titty. Just wait. Boom! Damn it. Why can't you wait at least and give me one chance to make you happy? Only one. I swear I've never had one. It's too big all, all around, huh? I won't go. Uh -huh. You wanna drag it out, huh? Oh, no, I can't. Now, why is you look real good now, you great bitch? Well, you can't make me go. Why do you think I ain't put a hand to you for how long? <clears throat> Why do you think you turned me off just looking at you? No, stay steep at all. He was here a couple of years ago and was telling me about the atmosphere in the theater. You got to remember this is, I guess, late 1960s, right? When this... Yeah, 68, 69, right. And the audience really got into it. 
and well, would yell things out. Uh, oh, must have yeah. made it hard to concentrate, right? It was very exciting for me. I think it was harder for Jimmy because, first of all, uh, the audiences changed from virtually all white audiences in the beginning of the run to 80 percent, 90 percent black by the year's end. Uh -huh. And their perception of the play was diametrically opposed. <laughs> so by the end of the year, the audience really hated Whitey virtually. That was me. Uh, I represented all the forces that really were against him, although I loved him. So they cheered when I died. And this was very difficult for Jimmy to take because, first of all, he loved my, me as the character, and second of all, he felt that the audience did not fully understand what the love re relationship was about mm -hmm. if they could cheer my death. So that made it real difficult for him particularly. Uh, it was easier for me, except I was lying there dead sometimes for five to ten minutes while Jimmy dealt with the audience's response. Was there ever a time when he directed anything to the audience? Oh, he... yes, any time. Oh, really? Yeah. He would stop and he would uh, talk to them. He would be very angry. He thought they were seeing it in, in gross terms and missing all the, yeah. all the subtleties of it. And it was in a huge emotional commitment for him as well. And Jimmy never gives less than 100%, so he was truly sobbing. Uh, one example of, I guess, a lucky break was your role in All the President's Men. You played this, uh, this woman who worked for uh, Creep, the Committee to Re-elect the, the President. The bookkeeper, yes. Yeah, and, and you had information that, uh, that helped uh, Woodward and Bernstein fill in the, the puzzle of Watergate. Mm -hmm. Remember the scene where Dustin Hoffman is kind of gently interrogating you and, and you're... Primly That's sitting the best there. scene. That's the best scene, the one you're talking about. That's a brilliantly written scene. Um, and I knew I couldn't be... It's a very small role, you know. Four mm -hmm. minutes. Only about four minutes on screen. It was such a surprise that I got nominated for an Academy Award, because that would never happen today. You know? Uh, uh, that what yeah. they call supporting roles today are really more leading roles. Yeah, nearly starring roles. Yeah. But, um, anyway, uh, I had four minutes on screen that was a terrific scene which I knew they couldn't cut out of the movie because it was a pivotal scene it, it, it divulged a lot of information mm -hmm. for Woodward and Bernstein this so don't pay any attention to this is just for my memory I hate the I have a very bad memory it won't be quoted uh, by name in fact we get confirmations before we print anything I can't be positive that that money was used for the break-in you understand Yes, I do. But uh, people sure are worried. Which people? Think you could help me with the uh, uh, disbursement of money in terms of the number of people that were involved? Just how many? A group of them, about five. I don't know their names. Would Mr. Uh, Sloan No. Would, would he have any... I, I don't want to say anymore, okay? The bookkeeper, of course, was a real person. She never wanted her name used. Um, and it actually happened. You won an Emmy for your role in Playing for Time. Vanessa Redgrave was, was also in this uh, TV movie mm -hmm. about a woman who conducted an orchestra at Auschwitz, I guess, as a way to keep herself alive. Well, Mengele... Uh, who was the prime doctor in Auschwitz, was, uh, loved music. Mm -hmm. And um, Alma Rose was quite famous on the continent at the time for an all-woman orchestra before she was put into Auschwitz. She was Jewish, of course. And her father was one of the Rose string quartet. Anyway, f the story that came down about playing for time came from Fania Fenelon, whom Vanessa played. Uh, Fania was the singer in the orchestra in Auschwitz. And as related by Fania, Alma Rose uh, died in the camp under unusual circumstances. They think that she was poisoned by a jealous Nazi guard because she was going to get mm -hmm. out. Um, before the film was aired and after I had shot it, a friend of mine went to see a German doctor here in New York City. 
And he was an elderly man, and she was telling him about this movie that I was in. And she said as she was leaving the office, well, I hope you'll t tune in and watch it on television. And he suddenly said, I don't need to watch it. I was there. Mm. And then he said, tell me, how do they say that Alma died? And she said, well, Fania said they think she was poisoned. He said, no, I was in the room. She took her violin. Mengele had often asked her to come into his quarters and play the violin for him because she was an expert violinist. He asked her in one day, and she started to play, and then she couldn't take it anymore, and she took her violin, her guanarius, and slammed it against the wall, smashing it into a thousand pieces. And they gassed her right then. This is perhaps too complex to get into all the political aspects of it, but uh, the shorthand is Vanessa Redgrave is in this film, and she has a pro-Palestinian position. She's very active politically. Some people must have been very upset yeah. with her playing this role. Extremely upset, and, and they threatened to boycott CBS and, and um, a lot of things. My, my feeling about it was that that as actors, and Vanessa is a great actress, I really truly believe that. She's a consummate professional and um, a very magnanimous person with a, with a large heart that encompasses a lot of things. Uh, <clears throat> yes, she is pro-Palestinian, and she doesn't deny that. However, her ability to play Fania, I think, far outstripped um, her stance, which is not anti-Israeli, and we've got to make that clear. Um, I myself has been, have been picketed because I was playing, in 1980, I was playing a Cuban aristocratic woman in a play called Goodbye Fidel on Broadway. And I was picketed by Hispanic American actors who felt that they should have the role. Mm -hmm. Where do you draw the line with this kind of thing? Actors have to be able to play anything. And I, I believe in non-traditional casting, mixing black, white, Hispanic, whatever, giving everybody a chance. Um, so I think that it was that Vanessa brought more to the role than the, uh, her own political background. You seem to be one of those rare actors or actresses who's able to pick and choose pretty well, and you don't have a long list of things which you'll ask your heirs to burn upon your death. You know, <laughs> like anything but that in the time capsule. Right. <laughs> no, I don't have a lot of things. Um, there's a few, a few movies or things that I've done that I'm not crazy about. But uh, for the most part, I, I think I've been real fortunate. Another role that you were Oscar nominated for was Testament, and I was looking back over some research, and Roger Ebert, particularly, is rhapsodizing about, about this uh, mm. way back when, especially the final scene mm. where, where, where you're huddled after the, after the nuclear attack, and, and your character is trying to keep some semblance of humanity and love alive in the, uh, in the debris afterwards. How, how emotional was that for you to play? Well, you know, it was, an, it was quite something. Um, doing the whole movie of Testament was deja vu for me. I had had a recurring nightmare uh, from the late 70s right through until I 
till in the early 80s. I literally had this nightmare maybe 12 times. I would wake up in a sweat. My husband would have to calm me down. And it was about dying of radiation poisoning. Three of my boys and I coming out of the woods after a camping trip and coming out onto the highway and, and meeting thousands upon thousands of people walking north. And somebody shows me the headlines of the New York Times and it says 400 mile cloud of radiation blankets the northeast. Well, this is some dream. It was some dream. And it was the same dream over and over again. And I uh, finally, my husband wasn't there and one of our other boys wasn't there. Now, The Last Testament was a story written by a woman named Carol Amen, and it was published in Ms. Magazine. And it was the story of a woman with three of her children dying of radiation poisoning. The husband is gone. Mm -hmm. He's actually been nuked in San Francisco. So when I came to do the movie, it was highly emotional, the whole, the whole story. But I felt often like I had lived it before. And indeed, I had in this dream. And I had blocked the dream out. And one day, I was talking to my husband on the phone about three weeks into the filming. And I said, Ed, I don't know what it is, but everything seems relatively easy, like I've lived this. He said, well, of course you have. It's your nightmare. What do you think prompted that nightmare? Oh, an absolute abject fear of radiation poisoning, which I still have, which I feel is the main, the main terror that we face in this world today, that and any other kind of toxics or toxic or environmental poisoning. Is it just because you were uh, politically sensitized, do you think, or? I'm politically savvy. I know what's going on, perhaps more than the ordinary person with regard to nuclear waste and nuclear poisoning, radiation poisoning. But I, I have a long history with this. My, my grandfather was um, a pioneer uh, in medicine mm -hmm. in Omaha, North Platte, Nebraska. He was Buffalo Bill Cody's doctor um, from 1900 until Cody died in 17. And he was the founder of one of the first radium hospitals in the country. He had gone to bring radium back from Madame Curie in 1913. So I knew a good deal about the properties of radiation, uh -huh. poisoning, whatever. And in fact, in this country, we have no place to put the waste matter from all the defense plants that are building bombs that are creating plutonium, uranium. After you did Testament, did the nightmare ever return? The nightmare didn't return because by that time I had become very active in women's action for nuclear disarmament that Helen Caldicott founded in 1980. Helen felt that, that she had to wake the country up to what nuclear power, nuclear energy meant. And once I joined that and I became active and I started to educate people too, then, then the nightmare subsided. But the danger's still there. Right. <laughs> How well did you know your grandfather? Did your grandfather tell you stories about uh, Buffalo Bill? Oh, yes. I knew him pretty well. He, 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 he glowed pink because he only lost one finger in all those years to, to the radium that he was handling regularly. But his body was so irradiated that he, he was bright pink until the day he died. So if you put him in a dark room, would he be... I often thought that he would glow in the dark, but I never really saw him in a totally dark room. <laughs> but he was an absolutely gorgeous man. He looked like Carl Sandburg with a shock of white hair, but he was, as I say, bright red pink, and he, he lived till he was 96. He did not die of radiation poisoning, but my grandmother developed a brain tumor and had half of her brain removed and lived for the next 30 years as a semi-vegetable. And I kept saying to my father, that's because you kept the radium in the icebox. <laughs> and what did he say in response? He said, it wasn't that kind of tumor, Janie. But, who knows? Your dad was also a doctor? Yeah. And I, I think I read somewhere he was kind of a pioneer himself in sports medicine. Correct. Yeah. What sort of work did he do in that field? 
Well, you know, he's, he's really one of the founders of sports medicine as we know it today. He wrote something called the Athlete's Bill of Rights in the 50s, which says that any contact sport in any school where young people are involved, uh, you have to have some kind of a physician or some kind of medical service on the grounds because an athlete is entitled to that. Um, he was a doctor for the Harvard football team. And, um, orthopedic procedures, was he kind of at the forefront of that? Exactly, orthopedic procedures specifically for sports. Mm -hmm. Knees, a lot of lateral knee injuries. Yeah. We're back with Jane Alexander right after this. What about the TV movie that's coming up on April 26th and 27th on ABC, Stay the mm -hmm. Night? Fill me in on that one. Stay the Night is based on a true story um, of a woman named Blanche Ketman. I play Blanche Ketman, who comes from Kennesaw, Georgia. And her son, Mike, fell in love with a woman um, named Jimmy Sue Finger, played by Barbara Hershey. Mike was 18 years old when he started an affair with Jimmy Sue, who was closer to my age than to his. And Jimmy Sue got Mike to murder her husband. Mike was so in love with her that he did not implicate her in the trial. And he went to jail and Jimmy Sue got off scot-free. And that's when the second part of the miniseries takes up. Mm -hmm. And I really go after Jimmy Sue. Yeah. You stay away from him. Okay. But in the end, he's the one who decides. Isn't he? And you don't quite know what has happened, whether I befriend her because I want to get her to confess, or in fact, whether I befriend her because, in fact, she's very charismatic. Jane Alexander stars with Barbara Hershey in Stay the Night, April 26th and 27th on ABC. Thanks very much for coming by. We Thank enjoyed you. it. Okay, see you later. Thank you.